Hello. Good morning. You can say good morning back. Let's get lively. Yes, good. We're going to have a very lively discussion here about metadata. Honestly, we are. We're going to hopefully give you some, uh, some interesting facts and tips. Um, let me just introduce myself first of all. I'm Paul Brindley from Music Ally. We are a media partner of Medem. We've been associated with Medem for a very long time now. We also run Medem Lab, which I would encourage you to come along to tomorrow, which is happening through most of the day. That's the startup showcase. Uh, we provide uh, information about the digital side of the business and particularly digital marketing. Market Music Better is our hashtag. Uh, so check out our site at musicanai.com. And if you're an independent label or an artist manager or a music publisher, you can actually get our paid service free of charge, come and see me afterwards, give me a card, and I'll show you how to sign up, courtesy of a couple of sponsors, actually, that have supported us uh, on, this, on this very panel here. Um, but let's crack on and get some uh, introductions from our panel first, and I think we, uh, if, we, if we do have time, we'll come out for questions, but it may be that we don't uh, have enough time, so let's see how we go. First of all, Phil Bird from Vistex. Hello. Morning. Um, so, Phil, quickly, what does, what does Vistex do? So, Vistex um, is probably more well known in this uh, environment as Counterpoint Systems. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've been around as a software company for the best part of 25 years, supplying rights and royalties software for music, TV, film, uh, and record labels. Um, and the system is used to manage all of your data. Um, in order to register songs, register recordings, and to process royalties. Um, and so obviously metadata is the lifeblood, if you like, in terms of being able to use our software. Uh, my role there is head of sales, uh, so I deal with all the music business, TV and film business, and brand licensing businesses. Anyone that needs to use software for managing royalties, basically. And that is both labels and publishers? Correct. They're yes. primarily your target market? They, we have about uh, 250 music publishers worldwide, uh, from the majors through to small independents, and about 150 record labels um, using the software. So they would be the people that you're most interested in, in talking to afterwards? Perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, great. Lovely. Um, Kristin uh, Graziani from STEM. Um, please tell us about STEM, a newer company. Yeah, definitely new. It's a little over three years. It's based in Los Angeles, and we provide technology to independent artists and independent labels. Um, so the hope is that we can provide different technologies at different stages of the life cycle. And the three core technologies that we're providing right now is one, distribution. Um, but we actually find what we do after distribution is a lot more impactful. So we're able to actually pay out all of the shareholders on the master as well as the composition side. And then beyond that, we are providing analytics, both marketing and financial analytics. So again, your target market is so labels and publishers? Yeah, Just so labels? actually the original target market were artists directly. Um, so we found independent artists, both bedroom independent artists, big independent artists like Frank Ocean that use the product and they were using it really well um, but we noticed there was a lot of white space within the label space specifically. So labels started using our existing product to run their businesses. And recently, we started to build more B2B features that layer on top of that. Okay, um, but you're looking for artists of a certain level rather than just a scale of like, you know, millions of unsigned artists or whatever. Yeah, so today, um, the platform is actually very much open to any sort of artist, but my team specifically focuses on bigger artists. So right now, they're mapped to about 150 artists. Um, they're management companies as well, and we service the ones that are larger and help them more with the creative piece. Great. Okay, thanks very much. And Peter von Rien, is that <laughs> sort of more or less right? Yeah, Not too mine. bad. It'll, it'll yeah, do. <laughs> uh, from Fuga, uh, based in the Netherlands. And again, just top line question, please tell us what Fuga do. Yes. Um, we are a tech and services uh, company for uh, music businesses. We're, we started in Amsterdam, but we're now based uh, in uh, in US and uh, UK as well. And uh, since rec recently in, uh, in Italy. Uh, our clients generally are labels, uh, distributors, uh, artist management companies. Um, and the core of what we do is that we provide a digital distribution um, service and platform that enables our clients to store all their metadata, um, have a very cr comprehensive set of, uh, of, of rights management options, and then distribute that content to over 200 uh, digital service providers. 
Uh, on top of that, we provide marketing services, and it's really about um, being in control so our clients, they can uh, manage all their deliveries via our platform and have their own deals with DSPs. And if they want to, they can opt into our marketing services as well, and they can mix and match. We also offer trends analytics and, and royalty accounting. So we uh, try to be a full service provider and been around since 2008 when we launched. So you're kind of treading on the toes of both of these guys. In, a li in yeah, a little a bit. Ways. I think we're treading on each other's toes. In, uh, but that's <laughs> in fine. It's in good. a friendly yeah. way. Yeah. Gentle yeah. way. Yeah. Keeps, yeah. keeps us on our toes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Peter. Um, let's get into the meat of this then. Um, I'm assuming, by the way, I, I did want to just check. How many people in the audience are labels working in some way or other with, with a label? Oh, actually, well, okay, a fair, fair number. What about artists and artist managers? Yeah, a reasonable amount. And what about music publishers? Oh, right, so oh, quite, quite a lot of, there, there you go, quite a lot yeah. of music publisher target market there. Good, right, so between, between all of you, that, that, you know, there's a lot, the lot for whom this is quite relevant. I thought we might just sort of kick off with, um, I know you've got some interesting stats actually, Phil, so let, let's actually start there with your stats in terms of that sort of shows part of the problem here with the amount of data that we're dealing with and also the amount of data that kind of just doesn't even get monetized ultimately. Do you want to just get yeah, off of that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, because uh, we, we have so many different um, clients, um, we were able to sort of extrapolate some figures just in terms of, of, of the numbers of sort of transactions, which is obviously the output of, <coughs> of the metadata itself. Um, and uh, we estimate that there's probably one billion worth of uh, transaction lines being processed every month by the music business. Um, and these are lines which have actually been compressed and are actually worth something. Um, but that's we, not just across streaming services, that's, that's across, across all, all DSPs, yeah. roughly, is what, we, yeah. is what we estimate. Digital service providers. Digital yeah. service providers. Yeah. Now, there's another figure that's, that's probably a bit more interesting, and this is um, that currently we estimate there's probably about 100 billion lines which haven't been compressed and aggregated or reached a threshold that, that they're, earn, they're earning enough to actually pay out. Uh, worldwide. So, I mean, that that's basically gives you some idea of the volume of um, uh, of transactions that we're, we're dealing with here, uh, which just aren't being, well, effectively aren't being monetized. I mean, they are being monetized and they're being matched, and obviously they've, they're, they're, they're matching to the, to a, to the title data uh, of, a, of the respective label or publisher, uh, or label in this case, um, but they just haven't reached a threshold. And it just shows the, the, the amount of data that's out there, basically. Which creates a number of problems, which we'll which we'll come to. But perhaps just starting off, you know, and thinking of the the audience there, we've got a lot of labels, we've got people working for publishing companies and artist managers. I thought we might just sort of kick off with some some practical tips, perhaps in terms of you know, well, what what, what takeaways could they have to help them make sure that their metadata is in good order? Let's let's hear from uh, each each one of you in terms of you know your your most helpful practical tips. Um, I would say be in charge of your own metadata. Um, very important that control lies with you and that you license it perhaps out to other parties, but you always have uh, control and visibility and, uh, over, your, over your own data. Um, so if you're looking for a partner, uh, that's, that's, I think, very important uh, prerequisite. And, what, and can you clarify that? So what do yeah. you mean by that? Well, so, so what you see many times is that um, music businesses, they have, in, we talked about this earlier, an Excel sheet that they might want to send over um, to any kind of aggregator or distributor. Um, some, some labels we found uh, don't even ha only have an MP3, uh, MP3 sorry, of, their, um, uh, of, their, of their file, basically, and not, not the original master or, or, or uh, you know, flag or something. Um, so it's very important to have visibility and control via uh, a system, whether that is a, a counterpoint like system or stem or fuga. I think, I think that's really important and, and not just give it away. And uh, you need a point of truth. That's basically what you need. And you need that point of truth to be able to interact with other platforms seamlessly. And an aggregator or distributor should never uh, threaten uh, that they, you know, are, are not able to uh, send your data along. It's something you have to actually contractually manage. Okay. Kristen, what, what would your tips be? 
Yeah, so to build um, on that, we actually advise our artists to be in control of the metadata. So more often than not, we see artists moving a lot within the states between different labels. Um, and there's sometimes that they're leveraging more than one label. And they'll ask us to take down a track or move a catalog and we'll say, where, what distributor did you leverage to actually initially release that? And they, they don't know, uh, which causes a lot of complexity. So advice to the artist before the label is know where your metadata is, uh, know where the mastered version of all of your sound recordings live, where all of the artwork lives, because during the transfer process, everything has to line up in order for it to happen effectively. Um, the second piece would be when you're actually interacting with your distributor, labels specifically, it really helps us if you select a medium. So we see folks texting and calling and emailing and chatting, but if you select one single medium, it's gonna have the information in one place, you're not losing that data. Um, and then beyond that too, there's a lot of changes within the style guides from the platforms, the DSPs, that happens really often. And it's definitely the job of the distributor to educate artists and labels on that. But it's great that if you as an artist or a label keep up to date, so during the creation process, you're actually thinking through what are the right specs for my artwork, what are the right specs for uh, my sound recording. Okay, Phil? Uh, knowing how to spell featuring. <laughs> um, is it small f? Is it upper, uppercase f? Or is it just ft? I mean, this is where metadata you know, comes into its own, really. Is it just dealing with very specific details? Um, so it, it, having standards is the key. And uh, there's a couple of standards out there which are crucial. DDEX is, is one that's obviously used. Uh, on the publishing side, there's a very good standard called CWR, which operates very effectively in terms of registering songs. Um, and so basically standardizing is the key. Um, and music industry has been fairly good at doing it, but I think there's more work that could always be done. Yeah, I mean, let's talk. What, what are some of the more common problems that you've come across over the years that mean that because of some mistake, perhaps, let's just think in terms of monetization only, mm. and let, we'll talk about discovery in a little bit later, that in terms of you know, mistakes in the metadata that means that you're missing out on money, what are, those, what are some of those more common problems that you've seen? They can be anything. I mean, featuring is obviously just a, an example I use, but I mean, in well, terms... Meaning what, though? Can you explain that one a bit? Well, I mean, in, in terms of when you're filling out metadata sheets, whether you're filling out uh, registration forms for songs, whether you're filling out the data required for your distributor, is, is knowing which column the data goes in. I mean, DSPs are commonly pump, pumping out data of 500 columns of, of, of information back to you as, a, as an artist or a label, as a publisher. Uh, and that information, all of it, has already come from you in the first first place. So it's just making sure you're all aligned, everyone's got the same data. In terms of specifics, it could be anything. I mean, it could be a misspelling. Uh, it could be that things change over time. If you look at something like Blurred Lines, which had a copyright case um, last year, obviously there were a whole new load of copyright owners that suddenly had to be paid. Then therefore you have to go back and, and fix those metadata problems. So, you know, metadata is a, managing metadata is a process. Um, it's, it's not something that's ever solved overnight and it's just making sure you're on top of the process. I think that's the best you can ever achieve, really. Yeah, and I would say a part of the problem with monetization is that the data, um, the metadata that folks enter are, is oftentimes separate from the splits and the information as regard, in regards to who to actually route the payments to. So I think until those things are totally coupled, there we're still going to see discrepancies in how people get paid and um, there's going to be variance there. And that's an important part for your business, is it? The fact that you would register the splits right at the beginning of the process with the file, in the file it's metadata itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think also the, um, you know, the, the technology behind the platform can, can catch a lot of mistakes. So you have a lot of uh, thresholds that you can set before data can flow through. Sure. And a good platform should have that. And then there's additional you know, quality control that companies can do and have to do, actually, in uh, in some cases. Do you all do that? Do you all sort of, to some yeah. degree? Yeah, I mean, we have validations 
uh, all over the place. Yeah. Um, so um, it's absolutely necessary for, for, for data integrity to make sure yeah. the validations are, are working. Yeah. But that means software. I mean, you can't do That's that in Excel. That's automated, right? Yeah, yeah you can't yeah. do that in Excel. So I mean, if people are, are registering stuff themselves, they are their own validation, if you like. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is where software comes into its own in this space, is obviously um, you can get smarter in terms of getting the metadata right. And the hope is that if the validation's on the front end, the user is actually learning what good metadata is. Yeah. Yeah, you learn by doing in that sense. You learn by making mistakes. Yeah. 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 Often you do. Hopefully not too Unfortunately. Many. <laughs> um, another big problem is, is change of ownership. Um, that's something which, you know, is just a fact of life, complicated when mm. one label buys another label, when one publisher buys another publishing catalog. You know, then obviously the the routing of uh, all the monies has has to change. What can we do to try? I know this is not not a small question to suddenly try and answer in a few minutes, but mm. you know, what are what are the possible solutions to to try and make this flow flow better? I, I think well, it starts again with that control that you have. So you you have to make sure that you have all your metadata as a point of truth. Um, but I think you can also expect from the distributor that you are going to. Uh, for instance, that um, that they service you and that they have a process around that catalog switch, that they have a, uh, something in place with the DSPs whereby they maybe first deliver and then do a takedown so you never lose it. What um, is the normal process when you switch from one distributor to another? It, what sort of handover period and... Yeah, so, so I mean, it... it, it Depends a bit on, on whether it's a, a 200,000 catalog or a smaller sure. catalog, obviously. Um, uh, but it, it generally is a, is a process, at least from our point of view, that we, we are quite used to, and I think many distributors are. Um, but it, it, it first means that you have to uh, kind of re-ingest all your data, and that's why that control part is so important. And the relationship between the distributors has to be, in that sense, open enough to, yeah, to also I mean, it's not nice when you lose a customer, right? So, mm -hmm. but still, you have to be very. Uh, that's that's our that's our policy. We are, you know, luckily we don't lose a lot of clients. But sometimes when a, when 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 a, a catalog is bought, uh, it can happen and it, it moves over. You just have to be very easy on that and be very helpful uh, because that's in the artist's interest. And then there's a process in place for maybe one month or two months, whereby if it's a fifty thousand catalog or something, um, uh, whereby you interact with the DSP, you make a planning um, and you report back and um, and and of course we do self-delivery so our clients are very much involved in that process you do self-delivery yeah un unless it's a bulk uh, catalog then we run it for them yeah but uh, if it's if it's smaller then they just uh, send a metadata sheet that we ingest yeah what about the looking more from the dsp side so spotify's and apples of this world um i mean i guess it's going to be quite different because they've all, they've all got sort of slightly different systems. What are the kind of issues that come up more from, from their end servicing you as the intermediary? Yeah, so some of, the, there are some of the most important things for the artists is that obviously the stream count remains the same. Um, so from the lens of the DSP, everything has to be exactly the same as it was initially inserted. So it works in a way for us where we'll notify the distributor that we're conducting a transfer, especially if it's hundreds of songs, and we give them a window. So we, we send that data to them for about two weeks, and Spotify specifically, it needs to sit in the back end in order for everything to sync. So the ISRCs need to sync and the UPCs. The ISRC being the code that identifies the individual recording. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so after it's in there with both copies, both versions, the stream count will sync. There'll be two versions live, and then hopefully the prior distributor is comfortable with pulling everything down. Uh, so that's what Peter was mentioning. Fuga's really good at that. Others are not. And this, this can be a problem in terms of potentially you losing your stream counts and issues like that, right, in, in this environment today. Yeah. 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 What, what's, what is the sort of, what would be the sort of biggest thing that you would want Let's concentrate perhaps more on streaming services. I mean, they're the most important kind of players these days. What's the most important thing that they could be doing a little bit better that would make your lives and the, the rights owners' lives a bit easier? Yeah, I think facilitating the switch definitely uh, can improve. Um, uh, indeed, the, um, there's generally, uh, you know, 
it's it's quite okay in terms of not losing data, uh, but one you know one DSP is better than the other <laughs> to be honest. Um, Which, I think they are, go on then. Yeah. I, I wasn't going to I wasn't going to ask you, but yeah. now you've put you enabled me to answer, ask you. Which who's the best? Well, Spotify is definitely uh, good, very good. Okay. Uh, that's our experience. Um, and um, it, it becomes a bit more tricky, for instance, at Apple with comments, etc., and uh, reviews. Mm. So that's something where, uh, where you know, that, that, that's important, especially for, for smaller artists who want to build their, um, their profile. Uh, that's something where yeah, we cannot always promise that, unfortunately. Um, so I think that, yeah, that, that's a pretty important part. The other thing yeah. I would say is the matching of label and publishing information. Oh I know that's, I mean, that's, that's is, the big one. It is, and it's still a problem. Um, it's not really the DSP's fault, if I'm honest with you, because in the old days, labels would obviously release the records themselves and they would then pay the, uh, well, they would basically register the, 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 the license with the collecting societies and they would match the publishing and the, and, the, and the label information. That all broke down as, as soon as DSPs came on the scene. And um, essentially, it, um, everyone forgot about matching the label data to publishing um, ownership. And it, we're still playing catch up, unfortunately. We've um, been talking about it here at Medium and everywhere else for yeah. 20 odd years and it's, probably still gonna be talking about it yeah, for 20 years the way things are it's going. It's a problem. And it's I a problem not. unique to music because you're, always, you're dealing with at least two rights, um, which is different to other media. You're normally just dealing with one right. So it's a unique problem for the music business. Yeah, I would say capturing the information. So uh, if Spotify and Apple were to actually capture the splits, both on the, the master and the publishing, and then facilitate those payments, there wouldn't be data discrepancies. Mm, yikes, that sounds even more complicated. <laughs> um, oh gosh, we've only got four minutes to go. And I do, I do want to touch on music discovery, because I think you know I wanted to end by sort of looking forward a bit and it seems to me that you know what notwithstanding all the challenges around metadata and monetization when it comes to discovery and particularly in a world which is now moving to voice uh, with smart speakers gaining such penetration and voice just being a completely different way of discovering music than you know we're getting have been getting more used to with streaming services on mobile on desktop what does that mean in terms of the challenges for the metadata from that perspective? For how, you know, from helping your music to get discovered, tagging it correctly, what, what, um, what sort of uh, tips again could you, could you uh, give and you know, just tell us something a bit about your view about what that means in terms of uh, looking at metadata going forward? I mean, from our perspective, I suppose metadata is metadata. It's, it's, the, it's the factual information about a song or a recording. I mean, in terms of, of, of voice-activated you know, search and discovery, I guess a lot of that is the algorithms being built by the tech companies themselves using that metadata to be able to, to manipulate it in order for people to find music. So that's probably slightly outside our realm, I would have thought, but I, I don't know, there may be other smarter guys working on this. We're certainly not, but uh, there must be companies out there that are optimizing the search. I think for us, it's quite important for, for, okay. bo for both of us. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely affords more opportunity for discovery with voice. So there's the potential opportunity to capture more metadata at the creation phase. It also makes complete metadata more important uh, because it's a different medium for discovery. Um, an example of that would be perhaps the original uh, release date. So it seems like very insignificant, but Let's pretend we have an artist that released something in the 70s and then they remastered it and released it again. If someone was trying to discover or listen to music in the 70s and they didn't actually have that original release date, you wouldn't be able to surface that. So that, that also relates to not just voice but any means of discovery, but with voice I think it's even more important. Yeah, I would agree. It's, it's, I mean, uh, it will definitely have new demands for metadata, smart metadata or, or tagging. Uh, so you need, yep. I think there's going to be more bespoke options instead of uh, pre-formatted options to choose from. Um, it's going to be definitely interesting if you think about, for instance, the name of a track featuring on, 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 on several uh, products or albums that have different rights holders. Um, you know, there, there, there will definitely be a discrepancy other than when you would be doing it uh, from, your, uh, from your phone in terms of where the money would flow. Um, so it will be uh, very important in, in my view. 
Yeah, I mean, just as an example in terms of, of how it's not working at the moment, I mean, I was using Alexa the other day and put in, I asked for, I don't know, Yellow Submarine, not because it's my favourite song, it's my son's favourite song, um, and it wouldn't come up. And I thought, well, we must have Yellow Submarine. And I said, well, how about Yellow Submarine Remastered? No, it did come up. So... Oh. <laughs> You know, really? that, that goes Actually, to show. That, that sounds like quite a positive that it could even identify what the hell. Really so lasted. you know, it's it's you know, metadata is 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 useful, but it's also limiting as well. So um, you know, they, obviously. Last some... last question. We've got a minute left. A lot of this is going to be quite difficult for people really to do themselves. I mean, how much realistically can people do themselves versus having to get other companies in? I think you just need to look for a self-service platform, and there's just many out there. Who, who, who enable that? Um, I, I think it's it is quite doable to have your to manage your own catalog per se. Okay. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, Stem definitely works in that way. It has a lightweight CMS, so if it's one artist using one login, you have everything in one place. Yeah, I mean, I think. I speak for all of us here. Uh, software is the, is the key here, um, and making an investment uh, into using software to manage metadata is probably the smartest thing you'll do. And I guess also just you know keeping well informed, keeping educated, and, and up to speed with what's going on. Which, which you all, do you all do that with your clients as well? We have to. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you do. Well, look, there we go. We've managed to end hey, right on zero. There we go. So sorry. Um, the, I knew I knew you wouldn't quite have time for questions, but hopefully, you know, we've given you some some helpful, useful information there. And uh, I don't know if, you, if you're able to sort of stick around uh, to, to meet anybody uh, afterwards uh, and uh, so you can have some sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations as well. But if you could give everybody a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.